Well, Simon, it's great to be together again, and we are having a series of short conversations about leadership, and we're going to try to make it increasingly practical for people. But I want to pick up where we left off last time, that is thinking about leadership in a post-COVID world yeah. with all of its complexity. When you're starting something new, but you never know if it's going to be stopped, and you're dealing with people in the congregation who are at very different places mm -hmm. along the kind of freedom from COVID journey. Uh, and yet we know our identity is secure in, uh, in Christ as leaders. So how do we lead courageously knowing that we're not always going to make the right decision? What advice would you give for leaders in leading in a post-COVID world? Um, at one level, the advice you give in a post-COVID world is the advice you would always give to leaders. But it becomes, I, I said about COVID, it magnified things. So your weaknesses were magnified. They became bigger. Your strengths were magnified. And I think for lots of us, we found that quite tricky. You know, we, the things we knew we weren't great at, we suddenly thought, gosh, they're really undermining our leadership right now. And the blessing was there were some things we did well that really played into strength. I think you have to keep reminding yourself that you must hold very tightly to God as an individual, not even as a leader. You have to remind yourself that I am a child of the living God. That is my identity. My identity is not my title. My identity is not the number of people I have in my church. My identity is not the number of activities or projects that we run. And that is tricky because we live in a world that honours that, that, that esteems that. So I think all of us who are church leaders have been to conferences and when you meet someone new, within the first 30 seconds they have asked you how big your church is or they've asked you what you do in certain areas. And they don't ask you who you are or your family, that's what they want to know. And we live in this culture that says a good leader has lots of people and lots of stuff going on. And lots of us, if we're, if we're honest with ourselves, we realise we put far more of our identity in those things than we thought. Which meant COVID hit and everything stopped. So in the first COVID, for the first 12 weeks, literally you were like, mm. I'm at home with my wife and my daughter and I, I'm not standing up in front of people, we're not running anything. And you suddenly, gosh, my identity was in the start. My identity has just flowed out the door in 24 hours. And so what we must do post-COVID is, yes, of course, we're going to want to gather. Yes, of course, we want our churches to grow because we want more people to know Jesus. Yes, of course, we want to serve our communities. So you want to be running activities and projects but we must run them sustainably, mm. which probably means doing slightly less, but doing it slightly better. And we must keep reminding ourselves our identity is not in that. Mm. And one of the ways you do that is to say, we'll do that for a season. We'll, we'll run that group for six months and then we'll review. Mm. It's very hard to put your identity in something that you know is only going to be there for six months. And it's also very helpful for the people to know we're doing this for a period of time, and then it might stop or it might carry on, which just protects you on this build, 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 busy, 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 and then boom, mm. everything's gone. I think that's one of the things. And I, I think we've talked before about the challenge of actually defining what success is. Yes. And in a post-COVID world, we're kind of going, well, we've kind of learned the purposes of God weren't thwarted by COVID. It didn't affect what he was no. doing in the world. And we're, a lot of our conversations are about spiritual formation. And if, our, if we're wanting to form Christ in people, mm. the question ought to be, what's the best way to do that in each in, individual in the room? And we almost always default to, there's a big mission. We need to do loads and loads of things. Talk to us a bit about just how we, how we learn to measure success properly um, and what you think we as, you know, ought to be some of our priorities, perhaps, as pastors. Yes. I mean, I, um, I, mean, I think before COVID and during COVID, we began to recognise that as church leaders, we have got very focused on events. So Sunday, you know, so, lots of people, Sunday was match day. <laughs> yeah, everything built to a Sunday. Have I got teams? Is our worship going to look amazing? Have I prepared the perfect sermon? Mm. Is our welcome great? Is our language perfect? Do we welcome the seeker and the, and the church member well? And, and there's nothing wrong in all of that. You want excellence in what you do. Excellence, you know, honours God and, and encourages people. But I think what we've realised is that we are about making disciples. And when we look at what Jesus did, he focused on a few individuals for three years and his goal mm. was that they would mature in him mm. and would then be able to make disciples themselves. 
I, I think we've learned that again. You know, there's lots of talk about disciple making movements. I think the church is a disciple making movement. I think if you're a church and you're not a disciple making movement, you're not a church. That's what the church exists for. What we're trying to work out now is how do we do that effectively? I think lots of leaders invest too shallowly in too many people. And somehow we need to learn that model of Jesus of investing deep and long into a few and releasing them to do that. And again, that comes down to identity, because if you're meeting with hundreds of people, you can feel like, oh, I'm, I'm doing loads of work and I'm really important, to actually say, well, I'm going to take 12 people and I'm going to invest heavily in them for three years. Lots of people go, well, what, are you, what are you doing? How are you earning your money? You know? <laughs> and it's trying to balance in our culture doing that with the fact it's really good to meet together, it's good to gather, it's good to worship corporately, it's good to preach the word of God effectively to a... It's, it's efficient, isn't it, to preach a great sermon to 200 people. That's mm. a very efficient way of teaching and to follow that up in, in small groups. So I think it's trying to hold all the good, mm. not getting caught in the good so that becomes our identity, and trying to think, how do we, how do we choose a few and really invest in them. I think that's what I would want to do in this next season of my life. And what a little bit I've done historically is say, well, in the midst of everything else, I always want a small group that I'm working for a bit more intentionally and a bit more intensely. And when I look at my leadership history, the people I've done that with are still flourishing. Lots of the people I've tried to hit with this kind of broad... uh, Some of them are doing okay, some not. But actually, it's the ones that... You, you really invest in that, mm. that really thrive and really grow because that's what Jesus did. I think also we need to keep remembering we're dependent on the Holy Spirit. So we can feel like, oh, stuff stopped for two years because of COVID. But of course that is ridiculous because the Holy Spirit was still working on every one of those individuals. We are being transformed from one degree of glory into another and we have to remember the role we do play and the role we don't play. We are not sanctifying anybody. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. We're not transforming anybody. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. We don't save anybody. That's a work of the Holy Mm, Spirit. mm. And remembering that as a leader is really, really helpful. Remembering what is your responsibility and what is God's responsibility and giving space. I have no doubt there are people who grew hugely in God when there were no Sunday morning meetings. Mm. Because actually... They had to dig into the Word of God themselves. They had to pray themselves. They had to work as a family or a friendship group themselves. Where maybe they'd got a bit too dependent on the platform leader, they had to work it out themselves. And do you know what? God has, God has done stuff in those, in those people. So it's holding that, trying to hold these things in balance. If that yeah, yeah, it's helpful. helpful. And I do think as leaders, as pastors, those in ministry, it's helpful to remember, I think, the need for patience in all of this because God is not in a rush and mm. I do I do keep coming back to this what people really want from us as pastors if they want things if they want to meet individuals who are trusting God and have a peaceful presence a non-anxious yes. presence about them and what I'd love to just get your comment as well because I know you've given this some thought in terms of how we measure effectiveness how do we know if we're winning if the kingdom's coming what are some of the signs of the kingdom uh, you touched on a couple there, what with salvation mm. and sanctification. Share with us that. When I look at Jesus, um, he constantly teaches on the kingdom of God. And, and so I, and I grew up in a, in a church that, that emphasised the kingdom of God because Jesus emphasised the kingdom of God. And Jesus is feeding off his understanding of the kingdom of God from the Old, Old Testament. And so I try and I'm a, you know, I'm a structured thinker, you know me, Jez, so I kind of, and I'm a preacher, so of course I've got four areas and they all start with the same letter. So I think the kingdom of God is about salvation, it's about sanctification, it's about signs and wonders, and it's about social action. And although they, they work in a kind of, they rotate, they feed into one another, it's not linear, yeah? they're all going all of the time, you start with salvation. God broke into the world to deal with our sin because he loves us, because he wants a relationship with us and he wants to save us into relationship and he wants to heal us from the brokenness of the world. That is salvation. We know that save and heal, same word, God mm. is doing both in us. That, that is at one level step one. You keep coming back to it because we are saved, we're being saved and we will be saved. That's 
what's going on. God saves us for relationship with him and to become the people we were created to be. In the garden, it was very good. We, we, we lived in perfection and we were perfected. We, there was no sin. And that's still how we're designed. We're designed not to sin. We're designed for holiness and humility. And sanctification is the process by which we are made holy. And when the bits are being knocked off us to make us look more like Jesus, boy, are we humbled. Mm. So, so you go salvation, you go sanctification. Now, if you get stuck there, you get very inward looking, it gets very cliquey, it gets very ghettoed. And so what we see in Jesus is he had this perfect relationship. He didn't need saving. He had this perfect relationship. He was beautifully sanctified, which made him incredibly attractive, which then opened up signs and wonders and social action. Jesus walked into the room. Those who were broken were attracted to him. And whereas historically, when that which was damaged touched that which was pure, the, the pure thing became impure, in Christ, when the pure touches the impure, the impure gets pure. Mm. And that's the calling on the church. We are meant to bring signs and wonders. We're meant to bring the presence of God, not because we're amazing, but because God is amazing. And we believe that Jesus can do now everything he did then, because he's as alive today now as he was then. And the spirit of Christ abides in us. This is a work of the spirit. So the kingdom is about salvation. It's about sanctification. It's about signs and wonders. And if it stops there, it gets very kind of spiritual. But of course it doesn't, because Jesus spent all his time, or not all his time, we always say that's mm. preachers. The only thing Jesus did was this. What, what Jesus did was uh, on the way, he's constantly bringing people from the edge. He's constantly challenging injustice. You know, he turns over the tables in the temple. Why? Because people are making money off people who are poor. Mm. And, and Jesus is going, no, come on, you are included, you are included, you are included. Come down from your tree. Let me meet you at the well. Let me lift you off your mat. Let me touch you though you're a leper. Let me talk to you even though you're a woman. You know, let draw, draw, draw. Because Jesus wants to transform the social society, the society we live in. He wants to bring justice and, and judgment. And that's the call on the church. Mm. That's, the call, that's the call on the individual to be thinking, right, I'm saved, fantastic. Is Jesus, am I getting more like Jesus? Mm. Am I moving out of the power of God? Am I looking for justice in every... Am I fighting for justice in my workplace, in my school, in my college, in my, in my society, in my neighbourhood? Am I standing up for the poor? That, that's what we're called to do. Mm. And therefore, you know, in terms of how are we doing, you have to ask the question... Are we doing that stuff? Now, it's easy to go, are we being successful? But we have to remember that we're not responsible for success. We're responsible for obedience. Mm. So is my, is my evangelism being successful? We could say, well, if I'm seeing a, somebody get saved every week, I'm a successful evangelist. But actually, I have no control over someone else's heart. Yeah? My neighbour could have a dream tomorrow and, and meet Jesus and knock on my door and say, what must I do to be saved? I might never have talked to him about Jesus. And I could, oh, yeah, my evangelism is being successful. We have to remember, no, it's about obedience. It's about faithfulness. Am I seeking to share my faith? Am I taking some risks in terms of prayer? Am I managing my money to try and give to the poor? Am I writing letters, you know, do whatever I need to do mm. to fight for fight for justice? Am I being accountable to a few people so I, I'm getting some of those bits of me knocked off? Am I being obedient? If I look at my life and then look at the church that I'm leading and say, are we being obedient and faithful? That should be how we judge success. Mm. Our goal should be around those things, things that are in our control. Now our hope is we see the fruit of the kingdom. We see salvation and we see sanctification and we see a breakout of power and we see justice. But really, if you make the, if you make the fruit your KPIs, to use management for, you're always going to be disappointed and you're always going to be driven because mm. you're trying to make happen what only God can do. But if you say our, our KPIs are, are we being faithful? Are we giving room for the Holy Spirit in our meetings? Are we, are we remembering the poor? Are we regularly preaching the gospel and equipping one another to preach the gospel? Are we creating a culture of accountability and honesty and humility and authenticity? Okay, that's a successful church. Mm. Sometimes that church will go from 50 to 5,000 in a year and you'll get asked to speak at a conference. <laughs> Sometimes it'll go from 50 to 40 in a year and you won't. Mm. But actually you might still be just as faithful because Jesus says, I'll build my church 
and tells us to seek the kingdom. Mm, it's beautiful, really helpful. And I know you, in the way you've kind of sketched this previously as well, it's very practical with the way those things can intersect with each other. That's the sweet spot, that's where Jesus is. And that's actually where we find our settledness and our joy mm. and flourishing in doing what he's asked us to do, yeah. his heart on us. You know, I think in Matthew's gospel, when Jesus first starts preaching, his, his gospel message is repent because the kingdom of heaven is yes. here. And that, that word repent, I like to translate as stop everything because the kingdom's here. Yeah. And when you describe what you've described there, there's, there's no reason why you wouldn't stop everything. This is what church should be. Mm. Stop everything that you're doing, all the programs, and seek this because this is, this is what Jesus has come to bring. Mm. And what I'd love to do, Simon, in the next series of conversations is have more of those sort of practical things okay. that you've just sketched out there uh, and look at some very practical things to do with leading of church meetings and uh, handling disappointment and other such things. So right. that'd be great. Mm.